Thomas Fuller once said, A danger foreseen is half avoided. Hi, and welcome to Cult Life with me, your host, Robin Jackson. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Cult Life with uh, me, Robin Jackson. Um, And today's show is more about uh, cults in general, and it's all about cult recruitment techniques. Now, to those of you who who may know, I'm a former Jehovah's Witness, so I've had a bit of experience in in how um, cults recruit, and in my conversations with many other former cult members, I think... There, there's been there are common threads that that have come through in in uh, in the uh, in our cults recruit and, and and the efforts that are um, employed by a lot of these groups. So we'll talk about about a little bit about that tonight. Now, people join cults for different reasons, and one reason is it's because the popularity of so-called accepted religions is is dwindling quite fast. Um, a recent survey um, that was conducted, I think it was in the UK, reported that many of the mainstream religions have uh, have, have reported rapid decline in, in membership. And um, I think this could be very, very well be the trend here in South Africa um, and uh, the rest of the Western world as well. There's There's been an up taken and very much a a, a interest in mysticism, um, you know, New Age teachings and the occult, um, and and those interest in those types of of teachings and, and, um, you know, and the interest in mysticism is growing. Um, More and more people are looking for a spiritual aspect to their lives. And one thing, and what they find is that if mainstream religion fails to supply this, um, then there are are several of these cults around which which appear to to promise either a guaranteed salvation or at least a community of like-minded individuals. So there there are numerous anti-cult groups as well that that produce literature warning of the dangers of of cult membership. Um, There are also many ex-members who have written uh, books and and accounts about their times uh, in cults. And some... uh, but not all of them, would, would argue that their lives have become more fulfilled by joining a cult. Um, however, that's, that's uh, I guess, very much in the minority, uh, that, that view. Um, they may also say that their beliefs and, and their way of life are just as valid as anybody else's. However, these groups continue to generate much criticism and, to, and they also attract uh, a lot of publicity. Um, and in my view, a lot of them court it. So this is likely to be uh, adverse when their beliefs are, are, are practiced in such a way that they not only contradict society's norms, but are sometimes illegal as well. And uh, from my experience in a cult and, and the subsequent research that I conducted, um, and as well as in, you know, in, in numerous other resources, I've noticed that there's a pattern that is used by cults to recruit members. Um, One thing is that young people are especially susceptible to cult recruiting techniques and are very often the target. Uh, Many cult watch groups such as um, the UK-based Inform uh, and the American Cult Awareness Network tour schools and and colleges um, informing people of, of the dangers and the warning signs as to cult activity. And in 2000, the year 2000, authorities received complaints from, from families and uh, theologians and former members that a, a controversial international cult was active in recruiting uh, vulnerable youngsters on campuses in Cape Town uh, and in uh, upcountry. Uh, the International Churches of Christ uh, the ICC was outlawed from several UK and US universities for its alleged uh, brainwashing and aggressive uh, 
techniques in, in you know, in, in, uh, in preaching and proselytizing, and also for splitting up members. Uh, I mean, uh, splitting up families. Um, the uh, Rand Afrikaans uh, University at the time banned the group in 1999 after receiving complaints. Uh, the University of, of Pretoria um, conducted an investigation into this group. And uh, Willem Nickel, who was uh, the campus priest at the time, said that the ICC must be exposed. Uh, he said, and I'm, and I'm reading from an article here that says, um, we didn't ban them simply because we did not want to give them publicity. They are a dangerous cult and youngsters need to be protected because they are not allowed to leave once they join. And that is so true with many of these cults. On its website, the ICC, which is not uh, to be confused with the mainstream Church of Christ, boasted of being active at um, one of the high schools in Cape Town, Paro High School, uh, the University of Cape Town, uh, the University of the Western Cape, and uh, the Cape Tech Technicon at the time. Um, so cults use every available means to gain new members, but the question is, why do people join? Why do we fall for these uh, recruiting techniques? And, and, and what do we need to look out for? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit more time on, on, on the reasons why. And the, number one is, people join cults for, uh, the first one is intellectual reasons. Um, all of us have the ability to be intellectual and to use our reasoning processes. And uh, we, we are therefore learning and seeking out new ways to enrich our lives, um, you know, constantly on a daily basis. And in an unsure world, a lot of these cults provide authoritative answers to the questions that, you know, that has plagued mankind for centuries. For instance, who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What does the future hold? Um, however, this doesn't mean they, they provide uh, the correct answers, these cults. Some provide a false sense of security uh, with answers that play on people's ignorance. And cults prey on this ignorance and try to impress the uninformed with, with um, pseudo scholarship. Um, and uh, if you if you go back in the history of many of the 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 older uh, cults and the more mainstream cults, um, a lot of the pseudo science and pseudo scholarship is, is very evident in in their their, their teachings um, uh, and, and and their writings. The Way International's founder um, uh, quoted profusely from Hebrew and Greek uh, to give the impression of scholarship. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, also give a similar impression when going from door to door um, by quoting scripture and quoting from, um, you know, sometimes uh, speaking about the Hebrew and the Greek scriptures. Um, yeah, so uh, intellectual reasons is, is certainly one way or one reason why people. Uh, get drawn into cults. The next one is, is emotional reasons. And um, our emotional makeup allows us to experience emotions of, of, of joy, love, peace, happiness, kindness, and other qualities. However, our emotional makeup also produces qualities of hatred, restlessness, depression, um, selfishness, and so forth. Um, and in this way, cults appeal to our basic emotional needs. We need a sense of, of meaningful direction and need to feel loved at times and very often. Um, uh, Im individuals who have uh, emotional problems or have a, an identity crisis are are particularly susceptible to being recruited into a cult. Um, low, low points in people's lives, such as um, you know, death of a loved one, uh, are the opportunities that, that cults often seek out to employ their recruitment techniques. And I know it's one, it's one, one way the, the Jehovah's Witnesses always try and recruit uh, people. It's, it's, it's at, um, you know, when there's a death of a loved one, they... They try and comfort the, the bereaved by uh, 
um, you know, the promise, the so-called promise of uh, seeing their dead loved ones again in uh, on paradise earth, or they will might be resurrected and, and so forth. And, and uh, yeah, so cults take advantage of this and, and offer ready-made solutions that are ultimately unsatisfying. The cults ultimately tell their followers that um, what to think, how to behave, and emphasize dependency on the group or the leader for emotional stability. Another reason why people join cults it's, is because of social reasons. Um, we are not solitary beings. We are social beings. So our relationship to humanity is born from our our social influence. Um, we are active in, in society and fulfill our desire to be part of a group. Um, and when group life is disrupted um, because of, uh, could be dysfunctional family, um, a bad church atmosphere, um, political issues or, or burnout at the workplace, people want to drop out of society and the cults are often there to, to catch them, to catch these people up, to lap them up. Um, and the cults also take advantage of other social factors, such as when the hypocrisy of some religious leaders comes to the fore. Um, they highlight these incidents and, and assure their followers that they have made the right move by joining them instead. However, when the group's own hypocrisy comes to the fore, or their leader's uh, own hypocrisy comes to the fore for that matter, these are hurriedly covered up or brushed aside as, uh, as persecution. Another reason is spiritual reasons. Many in today's society find that uh, find themselves spiritually and, and, and spiritually and morally lost, so to speak. The collapse of religious values has re- regularly plagued humanity, and it's not and it's not a new phenomenon. Um, it's partly the reason some look to to alternative routes to faith and and, and the meaning of existence. And as I said earlier, this is where the interest in mysticism and and a lot of these New Age teachings uh, come to the fore. Um, uh, And especially, you know, the um, Western nations are are becoming, uh, are lapping up these, uh, you know, mysticism and uh, interest in in, in Eastern religions. And... uh, some feel that, that mainstream religion is, is failing them and therefore they become easy prey for the cults. So those are the reasons. So, And I'm just going to rat, uh, rattle them off again. It's one is spiritual reasons and the other one is, is social reasons, um, emotional reasons and intellectual reasons are the reasons why we uh, people often join cults. But now let's look at the techniques that these groups employ Um, and and, uh, here are some of the key warning signs that that could indicate that a cult is trying to recruit you. Of course, it may vary from cult to cult as to how these are applied. However, the basis um, to a lot of these recruitment techniques is is the same. Let's look at the first one. Uh, Let's look at hyped meetings. So instead of explaining to you up front what the group believes or what their program is, they will insist that you can only understand it by attending a group meeting. And when you go to these meetings, everyone around you seems so enthusiastic that you begin to wonder if if there's something wrong with you. And the environment they create is one where, where you feel so uncomfortable. And the only way to become comfortable is to actually join in and become part of this whole atmosphere. So this is an example of of controlled peer pressure. Um, This technique is especially used in in commercial cults. And I'll speak about commercial cults in a later episode. And and this technique was was employed, uh, an acquaintance of mine related his experience uh, when he was invited to attend one of these meetings. And he said when he arrived, um, everybody in the room was chanting and singing songs, uh, all in unison. And he said the atmosphere was overwhelming. Um, Before he knew it, he had a bag of books in his hand, 
which he was commissioned to sell from door to door with the promise of great wealth by following um, this group's special program. So these hype meetings are, are designed to actually get you into the atmosphere and, and get you to relate and get you to, to conform and to be part of the whole, um, the whole uh, uh, process. Another way that cults um, recruit is by uh, intense and unrelenting pressure. And they will call, you on, call on you repeatedly. Uh, frequently they will meet you on campus, um, at your door or outside your workplace. And they will trick you into going to their meetings for an hour, but then lead you to a long study meeting or a talk. And this intense and unrelenting pressure has to be kept up. Otherwise, you might snap out of the mind control environment they are trying to immerse you in. Um, and uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses call this um, return visits. So they would keep notes of people who are interested, records of people who are interested, and, and repeatedly call on these to try and, and win them over and recruit them into the group. They also tell you they are not a cult. That's also a, a, a technique that they use. Um, and most certainly this is, is a preemptive strike uh, against the possible warnings that you, that you will probably get from friends and family, which, um, which they know will probably come your way. Um, sometimes friends and family will, you know, from the outside looking in, uh, will see the warning signs. Um, but some cults will even tell you that Satan will send your friends and family to dissuade you from becoming involved with the one true religion. And this tactic or technique is often places a warped sense of logic, um, you know, in the new recruit's mind. Um, they could tell you the agents of Satan uh, will eventually uh, come and warn him that it is a cult. So since the group predicted it, the group therefore must be true. Um, and here I must stress, if any group tells you they are not a cult and that some people call them one, then for Pete's sake and for yours, of course, find out why. Um, Google is your friend. And uh, I'm just going to pull out an extract. Notice this extra extract from uh, one of the uh, publications that Jehovah's Witnesses use to indoctrinate recruits. It says that choosing God's friendship will put you at odds with the whole world. You may become the target of ridicule. Difficulties, problems and temptations may assail you, but do not let anything rob you of your relationship with God. And this was um, out of the uh, book called Young People Ask on page uh, 318. So and they're encouraging young people there to uh, you know to 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 stay in the group and 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 warn them that they might get be ridiculed and uh, uh, you know people might tell them that um, what they're getting into is 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 a cult probably or and so forth so so this is like a preemptive strike uh, from the Jehovah's witnesses a warning to the young ones and uh, recruiting is often carried out with with little regard for truth, um, you know, and so is uh, collecting funds. They will say that it is perfectly fine to use deception, and some even encourage their followers to lie under oath in in court when it comes to defending the cult's practices. The Moonies call it uh, heavenly deception. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses call it, uh, you know, it's it's a theocratic strategy. Um, and a former Mooney, Mooney and the author of the book Combating Cult Mind Control says that, um, he says, I have no qualms about referring to the Unification Church, which is the, uh, which the Moonies were, are known as, um, as a destructive cult. And uh, Steve Hassan should know, as he was recruited into the organization when he was at college, and one of the Moonies' recruiting techniques, he says, is to tell those having doubts that everyone will one day join the Unification Church. So they might as well join now. Um, yeah, and even in, in Dan Brown's novel, and I want to talk a little bit about Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code, which was so popular at one stage, 
he describes a, a character there in the novel by the name of Silas with the following words. He was broad and tall with ghost pale skin and thinning white hair. His irises were pink with dark red pupils. And uh, this fictional Silas, the, the fanatic assassin in Dan Brown's novel, is a member of the organization called Opus Day. And a little bit about Opus Day is it's an institution that has been described over the years as a Catholic, ultra-conservative, destructive cult. Opus Day, which uh, stands for the work of God, was founded in 1928 by the Spanish priest um, Jose uh, Maria Escreva de Balaguer. Um, try saying that name after a few tequila shots. And uh, uh, Pope John Paul II actually canonized uh, this priest on the 6th of October 2002. And this Opus Dei has uh, spread to more than 60 countries, partly due to its aggressive uh, proselytizing uh, techniques. Um, however, um, in his book, uh, Escrivia says that it does not welcome the masses into its ranks, but it employs a selective recruitment policy. So, in his uh, constitutions of, um, he wrote a, another book, and in it he says, to work with all our might so that the social class known as the intellectual, which serves as a guide to the civil society due to its teachings, which have no equal, as well as due to the roles that it performs and the social prestige by which it distinguishes itself, embraces the precepts of our Lord Jesus Christ and puts them into practice. So, Opus Day is different from most other cults in that it aims to attract the most capable, powerful, and educated individuals in society. And nevertheless, although it does concentrate on recruiting professionals and, and university graduates, it does address a more humble and, and less elitist public as well. Uh, many young people are often approached at educational institutions, institutions that depend entirely on Opus Day or the organization's recruiting ground. However, these uh, institutions that are, are guided by this uh, spiritual directive from Opus Day also feature strongly um, in their recruitment drives. Um, and, and, and this is how the students who are already members of Otis, Opus Day are usually employed in the, rail, in the role of recruitment uh, agents. So as soon as an individual is spotted and is ready for recruitment, he's invited uh, into the so-called circle of Saint Raphael. And once this uh, recruit is within the circle, Meetings of fewer than 10 people are arranged. The director of the circle then explains certain Christian doctrinal issues from the viewpoint of, of the organization. And as time goes by, the director then speaks with each new recruit individually and in private. And this is how, um, by use of persuasive techniques, uh, the young recruit is led through the ranks of Opus Dei. Members of, of this uh, Opus Dei are also required to practice what they call self-mortification of the body. Um, so, uh, you know, apart from having to wear a chillis belt, a uh, leather strap studded with a, a sharp metal metal bobs, they are off. They are required to use the discipline, which is a, a, a heavy knotted rope that is slung over one's shoulder repeatedly either on Saturday nights or on Sunday mornings. And, and they self-mortif... Uh, you know, uh, mortify themselves. They, they, they beat themselves with this, uh, with this uh, rope. And a former Opus Dei member um, wrote in her testimony, um, the book is called The Bitter Story of an Opus Dei Numerary, uh, which was published in, in Marie Claire magazine. She writes there, I found out about the discipline after a year and a half of being a member of the work. This is a corporal mortification practice, a whip made out of a strong rope with several strands. It is used on Saturdays, only on Saturdays. 
you walk into a bathroom, you take off your underwear, and then kneeling down on the floor, you whip yourself on the buttocks for as long as it takes you to recite the Salve Regina, or the Hail Holy Queen, uh, which is a hymn prayer. She says, I have to say that I would recite this prayer as fast as I possibly could, because the whooping on such a delicate part of the body would peel the skin off and leave the flesh bare, no matter how fast you were when reciting your prayer. So, members are being taught the practice of, of mortification of the body, um, and which is quite strange for, and, and I think it's probably a way of Opus Dei. Um, look, it's, it's one of their doctrines, it's one of their teachings, but it's not stated up front. Um, it's only a year into the into her becoming a member of Opus Dei that she she realized or she was told that she has to um, practice this uh, self mortification, corporal mortification uh, on herself. And and this is a technique that that is often employed. So cults would not tell you upfront what their practices on what their doctrine is. It's a subtle indoctrination process. It's something that is brought on um, through months and months, and by the time that you realize, or um, whereas I always say, if they told you upfront what their actual doctrine is and what their belief system is, many people would run a mile, not choosing to become members of of these groups. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses don't tell you upfront that you would not have to. Um, you would not. You you are not allowed to accept blood transfusions. Um, so yeah, it's it's a practice that um, they employ as well uh, by uh, subtly and over time indoctrination uh, occurs, and uh, yeah, and so they prey on 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 the vulnerable. So the key takeaway from from today's episode is. Um, the the recruiting techniques that are used by cults and these are the warning signs signs that that you need to look out for uh, in terms of cult recruitment. The one is hyped meetings, as I said before. It's the intense and unrelenting pressure, and then they tell you they are not a cult, and of course the um, uh, you know the subtle way that they indoctrinate. And, uh, uh, and 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 tell and mind control and brainwash people um, uh, is a way of of them uh, you know getting people to join very subtly they operate on universities young people are very much uh, targets uh, for recruitment many on varsities um, and uh, I've had experience of that uh, where where groups were targeting. Uh, the youngsters in, in university and also at a a very well-known uh, high school uh, in one of the areas uh, in our in our area but we'll discuss that in a later episode well that's our show for today um, I hope you enjoyed the show some hope you enjoyed the information please follow me on Twitter you can catch me at Robin Jackson 70. This podcast is also available on Spreaker, on Stitcher, on iTunes, and on YouTube. Until next time, this is Robin Jackson, signing off from Cult Life. (laughs) 